All right, uh, welcome everyone. I'd like to call tonight's meeting of the City of Santa Cruz Planning Commission to order. Um, Tess, we have a roll call, please. Commissioner Conway? Dawson? Here. Gordon? Here. Maxwell? McKelvey? Olivas? Here. Chair Kennedy? Here. The other three commissioners are all absent with notice. Um, so I know we have one, but uh, I wanted to hear if there's any statements of disqualification for the agenda items tonight. Mm -hmm. I'm disqualifying myself due to conflict of interest because we are employed by the Seaside Company. Yeah, so we need four to pass an agenda item. So based on the excused absences mm -hmm. and disqualification, uh, any other statements of disqualification? Um, I need to sunshine an ex parte communication which occurred on Sunday 730 between myself and the main appellant of the application at 925 Windsor Street, which is the second item on our agenda. During that communication by phone, the appellant, sorry, the appellant wanted to discuss the contents of the appeal. I explained that I couldn't speak about the appeal for ethical reasons. However, I did listen to the appellant for about 30 seconds while um, there was a brief summary of the appeal, and I interpreted the content of that information given um, as basically identical to the information contained in the agenda report, and that was the extent of the conversation. So I'm not sure if that disqualifies me from voting on the second item, but that is, uh, I think, for the commission. Yeah. I think you're okay there. Okay. So then I should similarly disclose a very similar conversation with Matt Farrell that I had. I listened for a bit and didn't say anything. We didn't discuss the matter. But uh, on second thought, wish I had not listened and had just done up. That would have been the best thing to do. So I have a follow-up question. So since ex parte communications are not supported by the bylaws, what is the process moving forward? Does that disqualify these commissioners from voting on it? Um, it's an interesting legal question. Uh, I mean, it, it wasn't really a two-way communication, and um, there, it was cut off. So um, I think well, you're they picked okay. Up the phone, right? I mean, we. I mean, I know there were other communications with commissioners as well, and they responded. You know, like, hey, I can't discuss this matter with you. So um, I think um, I think we're fine on that. It wasn't a two-way communication. Yeah, I just felt like I should say it out here in public so everyone knew that that happened. All right. Any other statements? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I don't know how long ago it was. It was a couple months ago that the appellant reached out to us to see if we could provide rendering services. No, I didn't know that this was going to be on the agenda, um, but I referred him out to someone else. So knowing that it was possible, yeah. and so... So you I had guess. no financial gain whatsoever, then that wouldn't disqualify you. Okay, I just, <laughs> if we're all confessing here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> This comes up a lot. This is a very small town is part of the reason why, but I just want to say again how important these rules are because uh, we can't be talking to developers, the public, anybody out of class. So that's why I felt kind of bad when I called back and I just want to say again, it's important that none of us do that. Everyone good? Comments? Okay. Um, we will now open the agenda for oral communications. This is a time for the public to come speak with us on anything not on tonight's agenda. So uh, any uh, comments anyone want to come talk about? Seeing none, I will close the oral communications and open the public hearing. Uh, I started talking about this item one. We will continue to a future meeting because we cannot possibly have four votes. We would only have three, even if the remaining three commissioners. That's right. So um, with the first item on the agenda involving 400 Beach Street, um, that will need to get moved into to the next meeting, which will be on uh, the 17th of August. If possible, we might have uh, like noticing yeah, I um, I was just looking at the at your bylaws here, Good. and um, I didn't see anything that would require uh, noticing. Um, you know, for that particular item, you're adjourned per the bylaws, so that would 
just automatically kick um, the item to the next meeting. The way I read it, um, mm -hmm. there are folks here that if they want to participate, that they will have notice via this announcement. And then we can also um, put some information on the website as well, just to kind of go above and beyond on the noticing. Okay. That, that works for me as soon as possible. And I'm sorry for the people who came for that item to postpone it so late. Good, so with that done, I'd like to open the public hearing for agenda item two, 925 Windsor Street. And Eric, do you want to just remind all the commissioners the order here? We had to talk about it, but I want to make sure yeah, everyone's on the same page. That's right. So um, this is a little different than a normal uh, project that, that comes before you in that it is an appeal. So the order is a little bit different um, according to the uh, city council guidelines uh, for hearings. Um, what will happen is the staff will first give a uh, presentation on the matter, um, and then you'll first hear from the appellant. And um, the guideline is 20 minutes. Um, that'll be followed by the applicant, who will have 20 minutes. And then the uh, appellant is afforded up to five minutes uh, to rebut any comments. I should step back. After the um, applicant speaks, you'll open it to the public. Then the appellant gets a rebuttal for up to five minutes. And then you close the public hearing and render a decision. Got it. All right, those time limits sound good to me. Did anyone request additional time or want longer to speak? No, we didn't receive any. Okay, great. Uh, Nancy, can we have the staff report, please? Uh, thank you. Uh, staff planner Nancy Concepcion. So this application that's being reviewed tonight is an appeal of the zoning administrator's approval of a demolition authorization permit and a design permit for a large home. And so I'm going to go over just the project details first, and then secondly, just review um, at the zoning administrator hearing the actions that were taken, concerns that were raised and addressed, and then lastly, um, the staff's basis for upholding the zoning administrator's approval of these two permits. So in terms of the project, the project is located um, essentially in the east side of the Seabright residential area. As you can see in the slide, it's in the center of this slide. Um, it is between um, Darwin and Frederick Street. Uh, the property is zone R15, or single family residential. 5,000 square feet is the minimum lot area. But I should note, for this particular block, um, the lots are fairly large. It's, while the minimum is 5,000 square feet, the subject site, as well as the lots that are in this block, are at least 7,500 square feet. In terms of a closer view towards, again, the center of the property is um, the subject site, 925 Windsor Street. Currently, there is a 940 square foot single family dwelling. Behind that is a 280 square foot, it used to be a carport, but is now a shed. And at the very back of the property is a 800 square foot, two story accessory dwelling unit. So the project involves the demolition of the one story, 940 square foot house, as well as the detached shed that's behind it. Um, so this is in the Seabright area, and while some of the large home design findings indicate and speak to the development on the immediate block, it actually, the standards also address the neighborhood. Um, that's also been addressed um, in the appeal letter. And so th the zoning ordinance in terms of what defines the neighborhood actually is an area within a half mile radius. But as noted, for this particular block um, that we're reviewing, it is predominantly single story. However, there are a couple of two story uh, dwellings on this site. And so I just want to start off with, uh, again, for this immediate block. Um, as you can see at the bottom of the slide, there's an orange umbrella. That's one of the two story homes. And then, and this is a view of the property from the north. Um, across the street is where the other two story home is, and also adjacent to the subject site to the left, I guess is the way to put it, is the other two story home. Um, both of these two properties that have two story additions have been developed at the back 
of the existing single story dwellings. Um, back in 2005, um, but in terms of regulations, there was no requirement for a step back or a distance from the front property line. Additionally, there was no requirement for a floor area ratio. It's just the way that uh, those two properties were developed in this predominantly single story neighborhood. So in terms of the project that had been reviewed by the zoning administrator, there's two permits that are requested. One is a demolition authorization permit. And with that type of permit, we need to ensure that um, the structure is not historic, which we did review and it is not historic. Uh, we need to see what the replacement project is and also provide if there's any displaced tenants that they receive relocation assistance. Um, the second permit, as you can see here, in the R15 zone district, um, you have a maximum building area that is 3,000. If you exceed that, that is when you require a design permit. So some people have this misconception that because the proposed single family dwelling exceeds 3,000 square feet, that it's a variance or an exception. But that's not the case. Um, in this zone district, is when this ordinance was created in 1992, that was just the general threshold. For R15, they found for a 5,000 square foot lot, a 3,000 square foot home would be appropriate. You go beyond that, we need to look at it. Same thing for the R17. If you had a 7,000 square foot lot, a 3,500 square foot home would be considered appropriate. You go beyond that, need to look at it. R110, 10,000 square foot lot, 4,000 square feet. So, so again, this is not the case. In this zone district, it's really, again, if you go beyond 3,000 square foot, it's just a threshold. Um, and even further, so if you propose a house that was 2,999 square feet, um, there's no discretion involved. You basically, it's just a building permit application. You could build a two and a half story house, 30 feet to the midpoint or 30 feet to the top of a flat roofed structure. Um, you, if you meet your 20-foot front yard setback, your 20-foot rear yard setback, your 5-foot side yard setbacks, there, there's no discretion. You know, they could essentially build a pretty large box. So anyway, that, the project that is before you is over 3,000 square feet, and that's essentially why it's at a public hearing review. So with that, um, I'm just going to start off with the site plan. So as you can see where Windsor Street is, the site plan that's shown, the buildings that will be demolished, they're the kind of goldenrod colored uh, structures. The proposed dwelling that will replace it is essentially where the additional light green area is. Um, and in terms of perspective, uh, the two story is to the right or to the east. Um, there's a one story that is to the west. So again, um, the dwelling units is pretty much in the same footprint as the existing two buildings that will be demolished. And then in terms of its placement, the proposed single family dwelling, dwelling will continue to be in the same alignment. It will be, have a 20 foot front yard setback. Um, the district requires 20 feet and the project proposed will also continue to be 20 feet. So in terms of the proposed house, um, it's going to be a two-story. Um, the main living areas, so on the left is the first floor. The main living areas um, are on the first floor with the living room towards the street. Towards the center is the dining room and kitchen area. And towards the back is a bedroom. And on the second floor, there will be four additional bedrooms. So in terms of elevations, um, the project is does allow for the zone district a two and a half story, um, 30 foot high building. Uh, the proposal is two stories, it's not two and a half, and it's 24 seven at the midpoint, 28 feet at the ridge or the, at the top of the building. As you can see here in terms of architectural detailing, there's horizontal Siding on the first floor, vertical siding on the second. There's a wood belly band to kind of define the two stories. Um, the doors and windows are wood trimmed. And the design also employs 
um, towards the upper right is the front of the of the building facing Windsor. Um, it, had, it has employed some projections and insets and overall some different gables to help break up the general mass. So as noted, this project first came in and had to go to a public hearing. When staff first reviewed it, and that's the upper with the initial submittal, um, staff did find the proposal fairly blocky. There was minimal articulation and indicated that to the applicants. Uh, they came back on, you can see the second area, with revised plans. Um, and staff found that this helped break up the mass provided some nice architectural detailing, and then took it to a public hearing. So at the public hearing, um, the zoning administrator found that most of the findings for a design permit for a large home could be met. At the public hearing, though, there was concerns regarding the east elevation. So as you can see on this, the second area, that essentially it is a long continuous wall. Um, staff had, again, trying to take into account the fact that the building code, the allowed setbacks of five feet, um, and the fact that this project actually, it is not really shown that clearly, but they had the, you know, different kind of siding types and a belly band that we did not require, staff did not require it to be changed. The zoning administrator heard from the community, the neighborhood, and continued the item to address that wall as well as the privacy impacts that were brought up at the hearing. So as you see on the third, after the zoning administrator continued it, the applicants then came back with the design that now for that uh, wall, which is about 60 feet, about a third of it was inset. Um, they also reduced several of the windows. And so with that, the zoning administrator then approved the project. Um, the last part with the revision with the projection comment, I'm going to go into more detail with that in, in just a minute. But so in terms of the project, um, this was approved by the zoning administrator and then it was appealed. And so briefly, I'm just going to go over the concerns that were raised and how the zoning administrator in their review found that those concerns had been addressed. Um, so the first one I want to go over, which they indicated was the scale, the private impacts to the property on the west, the step back for the south and east to address the mass and the visual impacts. So the one story is to the west of the project site. Um, when staff reviewed this, so again, the footprint of the new proposed dwelling is essentially the same location where the existing house and the detached shed are, um, that there's a 10-foot driveway that is going to be retained. As you can see, the property to the west, they also have a driveway, which is about 10 feet in width. So there's about a 20-foot separation between the proposed house and then the existing one-story house to the west. Um, so with that, and also with the indentation in front of the shed, that also is being retained in the proposal. So with that, staff found that that separation, about 20 feet, was a, a good means to address privacy impacts. In addition, if you look at the floor plan, the floor plan, again, the, the main living area is towards the street. The wall or the improvements that will be a, adjacent to the west elevation you know, is basically a laundry room, a stairway, a pantry, and then at the inset, it's a bathroom. So by design and by use, staff found that in terms of privacy impacts or how to address a single-story building, um, that was done with design. Same thing with the second floor. The second level, the front bedroom is towards the street, but the rest of the improvements include a bathroom, a stairway, and another bathroom in terms of proximity to, again, the property to the west. In terms of the concern regarding mass and visual impacts for the property to the south, that is actually the front setback or towards Windsor Street. Um, it's fairly standard to along the front or along the street that that's pretty much a public view. So how to address privacy impacts to the street when pretty much that is what 
staff focuses on as the public gift or public view. Um, we felt, you know, with the design, um, they do have a projection, but it's very similar to other development along the street. Um, in terms of, again, there's a request to do a step back. There is no required step back in either the design findings or in the R1 zone district. So, and additionally, there's not a floor area requirement. So, the staff in the review um, indicate that to the zoning administrator and thus the design as shown was um, approved. A concern was brought up about, that was discussed at the public hearing with the zoning administrator regarding the east and the long uninterrupted exterior walls. Staff found that with this inset, um, it did break up the walls. The reduction of the windows that would have been reduced also addressed some of the privacy concerns. Um, the two windows that are shown here could not be reduced because they are bedroom windows and they had to address the building code, which is, you know, for emergency escape and rescue windows, there's a minimum size. So those were not changed. Um, so regarding the privacy impacts, as I noted that the side yard setback is five feet, it's pretty standard. Um, and because we are in an urbanized area, having a balance between the building code and privacy impacts in an urban area, you're, you're going to have, especially along the side yard where each property is allowed to be five feet away from the property line, there's going to be some concerns and impacts. So um, the code tries to address that. We found that the applicant with its inset, usually the first floor, Pretty much everyone builds a fence, so the privacy impacts on the first floor is pretty much addressed. The second floor with the set-in and the reduction of windows, um, staff found, as well as the zoning administrator, that that issue had been adequately addressed. The other concern that was raised in the appeal was the varied structure design, the form, the scale, and the fact that there's a two-story design. So what this slide shows is the proposal on the left, adjacent to the other two story, the one of the two, two stories on this block, and the perspective in terms of height. Um, so again, the project building height is 24 seven. The adjacent site to the right or to the east is actually 25 feet. As you can see, it's a fairly compatible scale. Um, the project has employed varying gables and porches, similar to the adjacent property. And in terms of having a, a change to the streetscape, we found that the design addressed it and it created a compatible two-story, again, not, it's not a two-and-a-half-story um, scale. And then the other concern that had been brought up dealt with setbacks and projections. So one of the things, this is showing the project as it was approved. And on the second level above the porch is a projection which the appellant said, you know, can't be approved. So staff in practice has approved bay windows, bay rooms, um, because the main issue, not issue, but desire with projections is to have that varied look. It, it, you know, not cookie cutter, look, break up the wall. Um, but in terms of the definition of a projection, it can only be a third of the wall in which it's located. So with the design in which they did vary the wall where they created an inset, technically that area above the project or the porch is not a projection. So um, that concern did indicate to uh, the zoning administrator and to the applicant, the zoning administrator did approve it, just based on the intent and the purpose of projections, and so it was approved as such. However, with that, um, even though it was not required, the applicants did revise it, and so as shown on that progression, this is the poor submittal or the new submittal uh, where they've removed, the applicants did remove the projection. So both bays on the second floor do meet the 20-foot setback. They're not considered projections. Um, it also did reduce some of the square footage. So the project then ended up being 3,564 square feet. So again, this was not something that staff or the zone administrator required. 
for the applicants in terms of if you look at the clear definition of projection um, decided to do so. So to be totally clear, the, the porch doesn't count in that? It pro uh, the porch can project, and it does from the Step wall back. on the first floor. Okay. Because you look at the entire wall, and as long as it's no greater than a third, then it's fine. The second floor, because we did make them kind of vary, and they ended up with insetting a portion of that wall, right. technically that wall or that upper area above the porch is not projecting. But the porch itself, it's okay that it's in the The first setback. floor porch yeah. is correct, yeah. yes. So in terms of um, the review, the zoning administrator did find that based on the building siding and the layout, it is the same general footprint. And in terms of maintaining the setbacks, the project employed that. Um, the building height and stories is compatible. The proposal, again, is for two stories. It's predominantly on, on this block single story, and so a two-story was appropriate. Um, it's not two and a half stories, and it's definitely, you know, it's five feet less than what the district could allow. Uh, the building setbacks have been met or exceeded. Um, as you saw in the design progression, it has definitely evolved to a project that had really good architectural detailing in terms of breaking up the mass. Uh, the materials, the incest projections in total helped address what, uh, in terms of the neighborhood um, and trying to tr do the transition from predominantly single story to a two story streetscape. Um, the proposed flo floor plans noted, uh, we find that it minimized privacy impacts. Again, it's a, sh it's a should, but not a shall. But we found that they were very sensitive in terms of trying to address that. Um, the site didn't retain the palm trees that are existing. They also have proposed additional landscaping towards the front to, again, create that transition with uh, the scale of a predominantly single-story neighborhood to a two-story. And so the end result, again, is a project for a 3,564-square-foot home on a 7,500-square-foot lot. Um, the zoning administrator found that all these revisions address the concerns and so with that, approve the project tonight. Uh, we are recommending that you uphold the zoning administrator's approval, deny the appeal, and approve the demolition authorization permit and the design permit for the new 3,564 square foot home. Um, there is only one in terms, oh, and subject to the conditions of approval, there's only one other thing that staff would uh, want to clarify. There have been some new state regulations that pertain to relocation assistance. So there is a condition in the packet, um, condition 20. We just wanted to add um, the additional language regarding uh, relocation assistance. And um, that's shown on the slide in red. So that would be in addition to condition 20. Um, so with that, that's the end of my staff report. I'm available for any questions. So any uh, questions from the commissioners? Cindy? Yeah, I just had a couple questions. Um, first, I'd just like to publicly th thank Ms. Concepcion and Mr. Mallette for um, <laughs> fielding my barrage of questions prior to tonight, so I really appreciate you taking the time. I just had a couple clarifying things before we move into the next section of the meeting. So there's a 2008 Seabright area plan. So how does that affect this project, or is it not? applied to this project? How, how does that fit into this? So the Seabright so the area plan, this is not within that area. It's outside so of it, the So it's outside of that area. So this might, you know, it's considered in the Seabright neighborhood, but it is not part of that area plan that is being modified from the original 1990. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so um, I think it's very clear that f for the objective standards that exist, that this project is compliant. What I'm still unclear about, um, you did say that it should rather than shall, but I just want to be very clear that the non-objective standards are on the table for consideration for a project like this. Is that, that correct? Because we've kind of been drilled the other way. <laughs> and I just want to make it clear that the non-objective standards are on the table for consideration for a project like this. That's correct. OK, great. 
moving right along. Um, so it's been, and I'm sorry to put you guys on the spot because I know that you don't review all the city policies all the time, so if you don't know what's fine, I didn't have a chance to look, but I'm curious if the health in all policies, um, policy, uh, takes into consideration like the city's climate goals or our emission goals, or is there any part of health and all policies that addresses sort of the climate crisis and, and how we should be thinking about that when we make decisions for the city? Yeah, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty general, much like the findings you're gonna need to make on the design um, permit. But that said, um, any project's gonna need to comply with our green building ordinance, which sort of gets at some of those um, issues that you've raised. So um, mm -hmm. I think it, you know, it's very minim minimally applicable, but that's where I would make the connection. Okay, right, yeah. Well, we, we also know that no matter how green something is, the bigger it is, it has a bigger carbon footprint than something smaller, even if it's the highest level of green building. Um, did, uh, yeah, I think that's it. Okay, thanks. All right, any other uh, questions? Um, were materials and color palette actually provided? I didn't see anything in the packet, although the um, design guidelines for this type of permit mentioned that as being a consideration, but was that actually presented by the client beyond these basic renderings? Um, it was not. It was not requested. Usually we, we don't for a single family dwelling, but we can if there's if it's like unique materials. Thank you. Also, I want to say I really appreciate the effort that you put into um, helping the applicant make this a much better design than when it was first submitted. So, all right. Other questions? Uh, thank you for the staff report and also for answering my my questions um, and thank you for setting me straight on the design changes. I missed that one, so thank you. Yeah, good report. I have uh, just three quick questions. The half mile radius, that's like just around, and it seemed to me like this lot was like on the edge of the R15 zoning, is that right? I was like squinting at the zoning map right before this meeting. It, it does abut a multiple residential zone district. Mm -hmm. So there's pockets, if you look at the zoning map, there's pockets of, this is purely a little pocket in the middle of the multi-residential areas. I, I think I might have a zone. And, and uh, saying to the neighbors next door, like, it could be worse because it could have been bigger doesn't help. But if it was on the other side in the other zoning, would that w could it have been a bigger home? Yeah, yeah, the zoning requirements for the RL, the multiple residential yeah. zone district, are quite yeah. if different. I remember, right, we had a few over there that were pretty big. Okay, yeah, again, it doesn't help this project. But setbacks are less, the height is greater. Setbacks are less, height is greater. Okay. Uh, one of the neighbor letters, or, or one of the letters, like, there's this thing about, like, setting a precedent, and I was scratching my head because it's not a variance. So this would just be building to the existing regulations as defined, would it, in your opinion, like set a precedent for future? Correct, so in terms of the review, in terms of the, the standards, those have all been met. You know, the one area where it could be, because it's not clear, even though we have had um, policy interpretations between bay windows and bay rooms, mm -hmm. um, that could be a, a special variation if someone was to say, because a projection is, generally a projection from a wall. And so by having it completely project, even though that was an original wall, I, we can understand. And, and that, in part, reading that, um, even though the zone administrator knew that and we've done that in policy, you know, if, if you want to say, does it actually project from a wall? It did not, so. Okay. okay. But again, you know, looking at the purpose of projection to kind of create that variation in, in um, design, uh, that was also kind of what we look at as staff, too. Okay. There's always going to be a little gray in there, because there's a word for non-objective standards, and it's subjective standards. So there's going to be a subjective point where 
the neighborhood's ruined, and I might feel differently about that than these other people, but the only precedent it would set would be a subjective kind of thing, it sounds like. Yeah, okay. I th I Not think under the objective parts of the standards. Sort of, sort of um, going off what Commissioner Dawson raised, this is a, an extremely challenging ordinance to administer. Um, these design guidelines speak to, um, they, there are some standards that speak to the immediate block, you know, the setback issue with on either side and averaging that. Um, it makes use of the term surroundings, which isn't defined. And then it also uses the term neighborhood. And there's actually a neighborhood definition in the zoning ordinance, and that's a half mile radius from the subject parcel. Oh, yeah. So while there's, you know, very few two-story houses, you know, on this particular block, if you zoom out a half mile, there's a lot of variety there. So um, we've got very subjective standards and we've got different terms. And so uh, I think the zoning administrator tried to balance everything when she made her decision. Good, I've got a comment later on the ordinance itself because we've run into it a couple times. Last question, again, doesn't, like I'm not saying the neighbors, well, it could be worse, but it, this lot would be eligible for an SB9 lot split in theory, right? So in theory, it could be a sixplex with two junior ADUs? Uh, four. Four. Four, plex. four yeah. I got a little two. Two two-unit two lots. Okay. Two two-unit lots. Okay, those are my questions. So now we'll hear from um, the appellant for 20 minutes. I finally said that word smoothly after 10 years up here, appellant. Mr. Marlett, in the meantime, I'm sorry, could I just ask a question? Sure, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, so disqualification um, radius for reviewing a project is, would you remind me what it is? It's so 500 feet, is that right? Okay, I just wonder because the half mile gave me pause <laughs> because I think I'm in that. Okay, yeah, no, it's it's not that far. It's it's a 500 foot okay, uh, just distance. Checking. And we we did look at the maps this morning. I know there was yeah, another commissioner that lives yeah, yeah. a little closer <laughs> too, but you're out of that. I'm like 150. Yeah, we we looked at it. Okay. Sorry. Are we ready? We're ready. Uh, Tess, right. you got the timer for 20 minutes. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks. My name is Chris Melville. I live at 929 Windsor Street. This is Matt Farrell. He lives at 922 Windsor Street. And we have the honor of summarizing the neighborhood input from all the people that you see represented on that map on our slide. And there's many of them. We'll share the, uh, the slides. So uh, next slide, please. We are not opposed to a large house. We're here tonight because of this design. Any large house needs to be done well, and it needs to be done to the same level of care and thought that went into the original large home design guidelines. They were carefully crafted to make them meaningful and actionable, and we think they deserve to be followed. In the red box on the slide, you see a paraphrase from the very first sentence of the large home design guidelines. It's followed by several well-written design criteria that are central to our appeal. Unfortunately, the project as it currently stands does not meet these guidelines. There is significant missing and inaccurate information in the report. Most significantly, the project's mass and design is incompatible with the human scale character and identity of the existing homes in the neighborhood, including a 62 foot eastern wall that still, even with the latest plan changes, looks and feels overwhelming. This project will be here for a long time and it will set a standard that matters to us as neighbors, to you as the commission and to the community as a whole. We urge you to continue this project for further design work so we can create something that everyone can take pride in. Next slide, please. 
So um, section 10 of the land use application calls for an accurate rendering of the streetscape and site context. This was not provided with the application. We believe one is warranted because this is a discretionary design permit. And that information was and still is crucial to performing a proper evaluation. What was provided is shown here. This diagram lends a false sense of compatibility to their design. As shown in red, it rises straight up almost 24 feet right at the 20-foot setback line with the high point a little further back. But when you compare it to the actual dimensions of the house next door, shown in blue, it's obvious that this design does not comport with reality. The existing house is, in fact, less than 22 feet tall. When viewed in perspective from the street, it is so much further back that even the high point is barely above the first story high point. Also, according to the staff report, the house on the right, which is 929 Windsor, um, is the tallest of all of the neighborhood dwellings they evaluated. They identified it, and Nancy just did, as 25 feet tall. Well, it is, in fact, less than 22 feet tall. This is significant because the faulty measurements in the misleading diagrams appear no less than three times in, their, in these inaccurate comparisons on page 10. And they were used as the grounds for their recommendation to approve the permit. What we think is called for is what the application very sensibly requires, which is an accurate rendering of the building height and mass in relationship to both structures on either side of the applicant's property. Now, while this issue alone should be sufficient to send the proposal back to the drawing board, it's not even the crux of our appeal, which is, next slide please, <coughs> scale. The next part of our presentation speaks directly to the large home design guidelines intent statement that I shared on slide one. Namely, the size and scale of the project in front of you just doesn't fit the scale of anything else nearby. It's not even close. I know it's hard to imagine, but the proposed building rises so abruptly in front that it would actually throw shade on those south-facing solar panels that you see in the photo an hour a day, seven months of the year. Now, I understand some of you may have driven the neighborhood, and I appreciate you seeing it firsthand, because this view is just one of many that reflect the human scale of our neighborhood. I'm going to hand it to Matt. Could uh, you show the next slide, please? Uh, this rendering was done using the previous panoramic photograph. We have uh, included one parked vehicle on the street to give a sense of the scale be uh, between the dwellings. The presentation, this image demonstrates the difference between the new proposed home and surrounding residences. We have our, done our best to maintain scale and perspective in this image and uh, want to remind the commission that the design guidelines require that an applicant provide this information, which was not included in the application. The proposed new design clearly dominates the neighboring structure on the west <clears throat> and does not step back at the second story. As stated in the slide, the, so the scale and size of the proposed home are out of character with the neighborhood and it is almost 50% larger than the current large home of 30 homes that were surveyed in our preparation for this meeting. See the next slide, please. Um, here we want to talk about second story size. Um, this proposal has a 1,737 1, square foot second story. It's three times bigger than any other second story uh, in this survey of 30 nearby homes. And existing 
second story homes are set back from first story footprint at, at the second story to make them more human scale. Shown here is a photo of 216, 218, a 916, 918 Windsor Street, who's, which is across from the proposed um, project. Go to the next slide, please, Nancy. Thanks. Um, finally, the design lines, the design guidelines talk about long, uninterrupted exterior walls shall be avoided in all structures. The one ten, the one foot ten inch second floor inset barely dents the sixty two foot long eastern wall which is only five feet from the property line. The, and in the application, or in the staff report, the revised elevation is shown from a bird's eye perspective, not ground level. And it exaggerates the physical impact and relief of the second floor inset. It should be resubmitted with the proper perspective as part of a redesign. In conclusion, we want to thank the commission. I'm sorry, next slide. In conclusion, next slide. In conclusion, we want to thank the commission for its time and attention. And we want to state that approval of the project as proposed will invite further replacement of smaller homes with visually obstructive dominating structures. And we make this statement because it's a design permit. There are standards that can be used to, to talk about scale of a second story. I haven't heard anything that says that's without, outside the purview of the Planning Commission. So. And it will, in our opinion, erode the meaning and value of these large home design guidelines. The application needs to include a true impact of the a representation of the impact it will have on adjacent homes. It needs to provide appropriate setbacks and scale for the proposed second story. And it needs to use the corrected setbacks of adjacent and neighboring properties, specifically 918 Windsor Street, which is identified in the drawing still as an 18-foot setback, but it's actually a 20-foot setback, and 922 Windsor Street, which is a 22-foot setback instead of a 20-foot setback. And we have measured that and provided survey information to planning staff and information from the, app, from the building drawings for the property that support this 22-foot setback. So these corrections would result in a required setback of 21 feet, not 20 feet. Finally, the Proposed home should provide increased relief to break up the long interrupted east wall, including step backs and articulation. We thank you for your time and are available for questions. Thank you. We'll wait till the, the, the applicant has had a chance to respond. Uh, so, applicant, now's your chance to come up. You have up to 20 minutes uh, to state your case. Hi, I'm Hart Walsh. Uh, I'm Justin Walsh. And we live at 925 Windsor Street. Um, I'm going to start by saying thank you to Nancy for the thorough staff report. Um, I also want to thank all of you for taking the time to listen to this case based on what I've heard tonight, but also from the many letters and also the form letters that were submitted in opposition to our project. I believe this is a case of significance for property owners in Santa Cruz. Um, what I just heard um, had to do with specifics of the design, and um, I didn't know what they were going to say, so. <laughs> Not going to address that, but I have some other things that I would like to say related to um, the letters and also the original um, appeal. 
Um, so many of the sentiments that we've um, heard oppose our plans because the house is too big for their liking. I understand that they just said that they're not opposing it because it's too big, but um, I did not get that impression. Appellants have claimed that it is larger than the allowable size, which is simply untrue. They have also claimed that the home is bigger than we need. You may agree with this, um, but we believe that we, while following the city code, should be able to design a home that takes our needs and wants into consideration. Overall, it seems the biggest argument is against growth in general. None of the appellants live in an HOA community, as far as I know, yet they want to be the ones to decide what looks good, what fits in, and what can be built. I believe that the city could write codes that are more objective in their wording. However, we are working with and have followed all the current codes, have not asked for variances or special exceptions, and have been approved by the planning department and the zoning administrator. This process of trying to get our plans approved has changed our lives. I am a private person who respects the privacy of others, and this process has left me feeling extremely vulnerable. The opposition has riled up neighbors with countless lies about us, starting the moment our sign was posted. They have spent the summer spreading these lies, canvassing the neighborhood, hosting gatherings across the street, and posting inflammatory statements on next door about us. The fact that the Ferris wheel had a quarter of the pages in the agenda packet than our project tells you something about the determination of the politically active neighbors on our block. Also the fact that they reached out to you all to talk to you ahead of time. Like I said, I'm a private person. The fact that my personal business and lies about me are posted online is upsetting. The fact that every detail of my hopefully soon to be constructed home, including interior details, um, are online feels like a violation. However, you have heard the stories of neighbors who say they just want to be able to see the sky. So I want to take a few minutes to tell you a little bit about us so you hopefully understand our perspective, where we are coming from, and what my truth is. So I moved to Santa Cruz when I was a teenager. Justin was born and raised here. We both attended Brants Forty Middle School and Harbor High. Both of us, obviously separately, um, grew up in lower income homes with single parents. We grew up as struggling renters, always at the whim of landlords, market forces, and our own parents' abilities or inabilities to pay rent, utilities, and so on. Since graduating high school, we have lived in and out of Santa Cruz because this place has always had such a feeling of comfort and home, even though there was so much instability in our childhoods. We got married and bought our house on Windsor Street in 2000. To us, it was a dream come true. However, we always knew it was too small to be a forever home. Our kids were born at Dominican. Our life was established here. But off and on, we lived over the hill and a couple of years abroad for work. During that time, we kept our house and we lived in rentals so we could always have the Santa Cruz house to come home to. We longed for the day when we could make our own decisions about our living situation. We lived frugally and we saved up over all of those years. Fast forward to 2020, we decided that we wanted to make this our permanent home. We started plans for an addition since we are a family of five and our house is approximately 940 square feet, two bedrooms, one bathroom. We soon found out that we could not add on because the foundation for our current home is damaged or non-existent. The foundation is so bad, in fact, that we are having issues closing doors and windows and the whole house shakes when we do laundry. Last winter, we thought we had a plumbing leak, but when we opened up the wall, we found that water had been seeping up into the wall from below and mold had been growing. The foundation inspection company told us we have only a few more years left with the house being livable. We have other issues as well due to poor materials and building methods when the house was remodeled just before we bought it. These issues led to our decision to tear down and build new. We spoke with all of our immediate neighbors, except for Chris and Dory, um, during the early phases of our plans. For the past two years, our neighbors have known that we planned on building two stories. We understand that there are only two two-story homes on our particular block. However, there are many more in the neighborhood. There is no one character or style 
that we or the planners have been able to identify. I put together a small packet with photos taken of just some of the two-story homes on a, that we took on a recent walk through the Seabright Central neighborhood, and there's a map on there that shows. Um, I took these photos from the sidewalk right in front of the houses, not across the street from the houses, just so you know. So they'll look tall because I was closer up. Um, okay, so those pictures will show you the variety of home shapes and sizes and also the normalcy of a two-story home beside a one-story home. The two two-story homes on our block were built as additions, as you already heard, the most practical and also least expensive way to enlarge an existing home. It is also what we had originally planned on doing before we found out that our house was not to be saved. Um, their design was one of convenience and cost, not aesthetics or functionality. Since we found out that our best option was to tear down, we had the opportunity to design something that we would love. Honestly, we had no idea that our plans would cause such an uproar, nor that it would impact any remote neighbors in any way. I still don't understand how it impacts people who don't live right near us, um, besides the fact that allowing our home to be built could start a domino effect of larger homes. This probably will happen, but most likely over a long period of time. We want to create a home that is comfortable for our whole family. Even though a couple of our kids are in college, and a third will be close to leaving before we are able to get started with this project. We know how hard it is for young people to make a start these days, and our kids feel the same connection to Santa Cruz that we do. They have asked for space in the new home. We also have aging parents, three of whom did not prepare well for their retirement. Some live nearby, some do not. We are the only responsible and able children who can offer assistance to them. We do not want to live in a compound, but since we are building, we would like to make sure we have space for those who may rely on us. I'm telling you all of this because I think it makes sense for you to understand where we are coming from emotionally and needs-wise. We want to build a family home. We are owner builders and plan to do all the work we are legally allowed to do on our own. We are not millionaires. We do not own any other homes. We are not strangers to this neighborhood. We are not developers. We have gone through many iterations of our house plans, including plans that were under 3,000 square feet. However, based on our needs and the cost benefits involved, we settled on a larger home. This perhaps was our biggest mistake because it set off a flurry of concerns. We did talk with neighbors a little, but we quickly realized that there was no way to please everyone. Our immediate neighbors, Dory and Chris, were concerned that we could see into their yard, even though they already have a two-story house that looks into our yard. Our other immediate neighbors are Sue and Ken. Sue was concerned about privacy, and we tried to take that into account by only putting one bedroom with windows on that side of the house in the least intrusive position. Ken wanted to be able to see the sky and does not support a two-story home of any type, which does not seem reasonable to us. Our neighbors across the street, Chuck and Sue, want privacy, which we believe is taken care of by their privacy fence, our plans for vegetation in the front yard, and the distance between our houses. Matt and Connie's biggest concern was the size. They wanted us to keep it under 3,000 square feet since they thought that should be the maximum allowable size. Our current plan allows for more privacy for ourselves and our neighbors than the smaller home we have also designed, which, as Nancy mentioned, would require no public review. Um, also, we have not asked for any variances or special exceptions. At our first zoning administration meeting, the neighborhood stood up together against us. Many lies were told during that meeting, and the neighbors who know us and who we had positive relationships with all these years went along with and even led what felt like a mob. That was a traumatic experience for me and one that taught me about their true nature and intentions. Because of that, we have not been communicating directly with any of these neighbors. Since then, at the second meeting and in their appeal, the neighbors have changed their concerns, shifting focus to drainage, setbacks, wall articulation, etc. 
We've been working closely with Nancy in the planning department. Thank you, Nancy. Every time we've made a change, they come up with another detail to focus on. It is obvious to us that they're simply trying to slow us down, perhaps wear us down, and also to make us feel hated. We are already far behind on our hoped for schedule. We will have to endure another winter in her current house, and these relationships have been destroyed. In addition, I think it's helpful for you to know that one neighbor down the street bragged to me that the neighborhood had banded together to stop development on this street before. At least two people on our street own the houses next to them, their way of controlling development. Chris and Dory offered to buy our house at an off-market price, I'd like to add, to perpetuate this model. I am also well aware that even if you approve our plans, this group of neighbors will probably appeal to the city council. Their goal is to control development. They don't want this in their backyard. We feel so fortunate to be in a position where we have the opportunity to provide a stable home for ourselves and our family. We're also at a point in life where we would like the power to make decisions for ourselves. Since we are following the zoning codes and laws of Santa Cruz, we're not asking for any variances or special exceptions, and we have already made numerous changes and accommodations to our plans. I hope you will see that our project is our right on our property. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so the next step is to open the public hearing. I um, am going to grant two minutes for each person to speak as a maximum. Before we open public hearing, I'd like to set the table for that. I had three quick points for the public and everyone here. <clears throat> and those were to be neighborly. You could hear the pain in people's voices on both sides. Just continue to be neighborly, please. Um, look for compromise. I once sat up here in a Greek Orthodox priest versus a co-housing project. We're at each other's throats like you wouldn't believe. If there was a, a God, like a lightning bolt, probably would have come into that room. So if those folks can work it out, you all can work it out. Um, so let's look for compromise and consensus. And then third, let's finish this tonight and not have an appeal to council. Okay, go ahead. Public uh, comment is open. Uh, anyone can come up and speak if they would like. Hello, Eric Roland, 951 Windsor Street. Uh, so my biggest concern in this situation is the size. Where you said you talked about uh, what was objective and size is, it's not subjective. 3,600 is 3,600. And if there wasn't a reason that something over 3,000 needs to be reviewed, then why would it matter? So it seems to be there's a reason for the review. And you know, from my little 1,000 square foot house, you know, it's not next to me, but if 50% bigger than the biggest house is OK now, then the 5,000 square foot place that gets next to me does impact. And it's also about just the neighborhood as well. Thanks. All right, would anyone else uh, from the public like to come speak? I forgot to mention, if you can put your name after you speak on the, on the uh, sign-in sheet, that helps uh, Ms. Fitzgerald spell it right in the minutes. Uh, Jerry Spodick, we live at 304 Darwin, and we're just about three houses to the west of this project. And I'm looking at the guidelines that the Planning Commission has set forth, and they seem so subjective to me that there is really no way on God's green earth that this complies with the guidelines. I don't know, I don't understand how they found that, but to me it's, it's really an injustice. And it, it's just not, it's not fair. It's not fair. And this, uh, Ms. Walsh talks about, Mrs. Walsh talks about her privacy, her private life, but she has no problems looking into other people's lives. So I, I think this really needs a hard thought. And I think it needs to go back and have them redesign it. Thank you. All right, any 
other public comments? Seeing none, I'll close the public comment part of the hearing and bring it back up here. At this point, the appellant has up to five minutes to rebut any of the things the applicant said, if you'd like. Matt Farrell, uh, I would uh, like to say that we basically are, as we stated in our presentation earlier, we're not saying that the owners don't have a right to a large home. We're saying that we want a large home that um, is in scale with the neighborhood. And uh, as uh, one person described this structure, it's very boxy. In fact, someone called it a shoebox. And I think more articulation and setback, the second story and the law at the southern elevation facing Windsor Street and on the east side will uh, provide some relief on that structure. And, um, you know, in our presentations to the zoning administrator and um, here, we've never said that um, in our presentations that they couldn't build a home. We've asked for changes to the design. All right, so now we'll uh, close the public part of the hearing and bring it back up to the commission for more questions, discussion, a motion. Commissioner Gordon. I have a question. Um, was there, I mean, we're, we're not seeing a whole lot of intricate site plan information in this packet in regards to um, the details of the ADU in the back and a site plan that considers both neighbors on either side. And I'm wondering, do you have that that we can look at more specifically? Um, so for clarification for the site plan of where the ADU is in um, relationship well, to? In general, uh, um, as the, the appellant had stated, um, my understanding is that you're supposed to be able to see both sides of the property as well as the property, the subject property. And I didn't see any of that in our paperwork. Um, I also know in past planning commission um, meetings that um, a site section has been um, requested or you know suggested in order to address some of the public's concerns and so i'm just wondering if there's anything that you have that we can look at um, so for the for the adu part so there's no changes that's the building that's at the back of the property understood so in yeah. terms of we do have a site plan that shows a general footprint of it but there's not like views from the interior of the lot looking to the adjacent properties Understood. Yeah. Do you have a site plan that shows the subject property in relationship to the neighbors on either side? In terms of just the submittal, which shows the placement and the architectural style, the, the building height, the setbacks in the street, that's the code requires that, but it doesn't require, like, I guess, a rendering of the adjacent properties. It, so for the most part, when this ordinance was created, you know, and back before we had Google Earth and <laughs> people could take pictures, that's what we have been utilizing to give a perspective of scale or what's the existing development, given that um, we try to make it so that the application, especially if it's a single family dwelling, um, the applicant doesn't have to spend a lot of money to, to show that. Um, in terms of uh, getting the actual height and such, again, you know, we take it from pretty much what we have in place, if there's any building plans. So like, for example, the one to the east, there was a building plan. So that evidently was what the, you know, the applicant utilized in terms of getting the height 
as well as getting the distance or the type of um, drawing to enhance that. The one to the left or to the west, there are, there are site, there's no building plans for it, which is not unusual because especially for a single family dwelling built in the 1940s, usually as we just, the city just has a building card. So without having to require an applicant to draw building plans for a single family residence at, from 1948, which in fact they don't even have plans for their own home that has that, like an elevation or details. Um, we kind of landed on trying to get the purview of or the perspective and the scale essentially through photographs um, and kind of utilizing that there's tools where you could actually take a picture and kind of figure out what the height is. So I don't know if that answers so your question. So is there a document that shows the proposed project in relationship specifically to the neighbors on the left and the right other than the, the image that the appellant showed? Not including the property to the left. Okay. And, and I think, again, that... mainly what we looked at, too, was there's like a 20-foot separation between the two. Understood. So in yeah. terms of a, a right. person's perspective of streetscape, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's true. It's going to be that those houses that are adjacent to it, probably two either way. Right. But in terms of just trying to see, so what is an acceptable height or compatible scale, especially in a transitional street that will, again, it's predominantly single story, but the, the code does allow for anybody to go two and a half stories if they were like less than you know, 3,000 square feet. Understood, I, yeah. I get that, yeah. yeah. So I'm really just trying to understand, you know, the appellant says these heights are different than what we're looking at in the drawings that were provided to us. And I think our job is to understand <laughs> what we're listening to versus what we have to make a decision about. And so I was, I'm hoping that you can help us figure out, like, when the appellant says these are actually the heights, but we're being told another thing. I mean, I'm just kind of wondering how, how, do, we, how do we know what is accurate? Well, I, I, I believe I haven't been really close to this project uh, as it's wound through the process, but there was some verification um, and review of, of other plans that we had on file for accuracy in you know the renderings that, that we have. Okay. Um, I guess that's about all I can say. And ultimately what you're saying is that it could have been two and a half stories. It's it, w that we're looking at this in relationship to the neighboring properties, but ultimately it could be taller if they wanted it to be in, that would be in front of us, right? And if it was going to be in ultimately an SB9 project, it would likely be two and a half stories. <laughs> and it would have a uh, much Potentially uh, narrower four different setbacks. units on it. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think that, you know, in the, the, what the zoning administrator did when she made her decision was to, to, to look at everything. You know, what, what are the code requirements? Um, what's going on in the immediate neighborhood, what's going on in the larger neighborhood. Um, there were changes made in an attempt to, to address these very subjective findings that we have before us. Um, and uh, yes, it could have been taller, it could have been closer to the property lines. Um, there are certain um, aspects of existing development, such as the presence of a driveway um, that provides a lot more separation than would even be required in an R110 lot. So that's Understood. that's how she arrived at her decision. Um, I'm just, um, I think that I think that was I think that pretty much covers it. So in terms I, I know what you're saying that like between the draw drawings, there's great difference between the measurements. So um, it would always be nice to have more accurate information. But we're not in comment I mean, section yet, or, or are, we, are we? Okay. Are we in, oh, we're just in right. question mode, right? We're going to have comments later, or are we? Is this it? <laughs> Questions, comments, okay. whatever you want. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just didn't know if we. Um, I, I just had a question for the applicant. Um, I see that, I mean, it says like no, or I'm sorry, new house and no gas appliances, all electrical. And I know that there's been a lot of movement. Um, 
in the legal landscape around like requirements about um, you know uh, renewables and what is and is not allowed in terms of what the government can dictate in terms of the types of appliances that you have and things like that. But I'm just curious about if that is still the case. No gas, all appliance, no gas appliances, all electric. Yeah, given you're the contractor and the architect and the owner, I thought you'd be a good place to start. Yeah, right? so yeah. Um, there you're you're right. There has been some changes to that. Um, we've already gone through pretty much the whole building department. The only thing that we had left in the building department is to identify somebody uh, to to supervise the structural uh, work that was getting done. So we had contracted out for somebody to do that. But pretty much we've gone through all our green party reports. We've done. I mean, we, we're we're done with our building department stuff. And we don't plan on going back for that, just uh, for a few reasons. We're somewhat into the environment. We both drive EVs. Um, we were planning on doing, also, I think it's better air quality inside. Um, so no, we don't plan on going to gas inside the new house. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's it for now. All right. Cindy? Um, yeah, I guess I will move into the comment phase. Um, I think I got all my questions answered. Uh, so, I, you know, I just want to kind of lay out my rationale and about how I'm thinking about this. Um, I've, I've certainly uh, read everything, um, listened to the testimony, and thank you um, both the applicant and the appellant uh, for coming um, and, and providing really clear um, and um, compelling testimony. So um, we've heard that, uh, you know, the large area ordinance, we, we've seen that um, quoted several times. Um, but one thing that really struck me in reviewing this whole project is, is, is the lack of, um, policies we have in place to really address the climate crisis. And, um, you know, we're not putting, I'm, I'm not putting this on this project, but I do think this project and, and we as a community need to decide if building large homes is the best approach for us as we are in a climate crisis. And for me personally, the answer to that is no. Like, um, so that's how I'm thinking about this because, um, you know, we have um, the ability to have, uh, you know, building standards that allow us to, um, you know, make really, really efficient use of space, um, provide privacy and all of those things. And that's how I'm thinking about this. I'm not coming at it from how it looks. I know that's very important to some people. Um, and, and really, you know, it is compliant with the code. Like, that's just a fact. There are objective standards and it is compliant. But the question is if we, we can as a community build large homes, but is that the best approach for us in a climate crisis? And for me, the answer is no. So I just wanna lay that out there. I, um, I wanna agree that I think a lot of what we're experiencing here really has to do with our design standards in regards to this. And I appreciate that the Zoning Administration and Planning Department has worked really hard to help this owner designer build something that is better or design something that's better and um, than what was originally um, designed, I do agree, you know, from a personal perspective, but I'm not up here, f you know, necessarily to make judgment on what this family needs for themselves, but I do feel like um, we set this project up for um, a lot of subjective um, opinion, and so I just wonder, as planning commissioners, if we can do something more to help with the um, with creating standards that might help even the zoning administration, you know, and planning um, require 
something more when they come. So as an example, we could decide that we are going to require uh, a large house um, design permit to hire a design professional. And we could have requirements that, you know, address climate change. You know, we can address these things more specifically, which obviously become more objective, but um, might help the process. So I think this is unfortunately more of a process thing than it is a specifically the project. <laughs> Made your job, I'm sure, really difficult. So I can speak to that a little bit. There have been, um, not only as a result of this project, but others, um, quite a bit of internal staff conversations, especially now that we have our objective standards in place for multifamily, about the need for, um, for it to occur for single family as well. Um, and so we've been talking about that a lot lately. And there are some grant opportunities available and that we're you know, considering uh, applying for in order to get some more objective development standards in place for single families. I think that would be great because, yeah. you know, maybe then there would be guidelines that the, this family could have, you know, looked at in terms of design decisions and setbacks. And obviously this is very design related and, you know, that's just one piece of this puzzle. But um, I think it could have helped everybody along the way. And then, yeah, there's a whole whole host of lists I'm think of things I'm sure you have that you've experienced through this. I'd be happy to establish a subcommittee if anyone volunteers for that in the future. Yeah, sorry, I wanted to uh, uh, make a couple comments, which of course are slipping my mind now. Um, you know, I'm a, by profession, I'm uh, I'm a high school teacher, and so I always like to get the, uh, the youth perspective in here, and I don't know if you mind, but um, do you guys, as the... Uh, youth in the situation, we're talking about climate crisis, we're talking about staying in Santa Cruz. Do you guys have anything to say about this? Do you, I, I'd love to get your perspective just on the situation. And just so you know, the, you know, this appeal does not, the crux of the appeal is not on your opinion. <laughs> I just want to get your perspective on this whole matter. You can take a second if you want, if you want to talk about it. Don't be shy though, your thoughts are welcome. You're, you're the next generation. Okay. You don't have to. I just thought it'd be fun. <laughs> I, I like to get the kids' perspective, you know? Um, you know, I get it. I, I think that, um, you know, I, I'm a Santa Cruz local. I've spent my entire life here, um, short, you know, some time in college and, um, kicking around some soccer leagues around the U.S. And, uh, you know, one of the things that strikes me about this town is almost everybody I know that I grew up with doesn't live here anymore. And um, I, it's, I'm sure you know how I feel about that. And that's always a really tough thing. You know, when I'm up here, I, I think about that a lot. Um, I'll be honest where I stand on this. Um, just on my comments, I, I don't feel like the Appellants really have a, a strong case here. Um, I think that there's the Santa Cruz Bible Church, which is about as big as Costco right around the block. There's the Star of the Sea Church. There's Galt Elementary. There's a lot of different structures around this place that are very, very tall, and everybody's fine. That said, um, you know, I think with the square footage, we are making um, an exception here. And, you know, it may not be a variance. It may not be this, but it does exceed the zoning standards. And when we are doing things like that, um, I like... Uh, you know, whatever project it is, uh, to have some sort of a public benefit. Um, so that, I think, I'm, I've really struggled with this over the past, since the agenda packet came out, I've, I've really struggled with this decision. Um, but that's kind of where I'm at right now. I'm very torn. Um, and I also grew up in a single parent, you know, family. I grew up uh, low income. We didn't have a lot. And uh, over time, you know, that changed. And I totally understand... Um, wanting to manifest yourself out of that situation, especially for your children. You know, I'm a, I, I'm a father too, I get it. Um, at the same time, you know, I grew up on the west side and uh, right next door to me was our neighbor, Kay, who, uh, you know, may she, may she rest in peace. She's a chain smoker drinking, uh, you know, 
cocktails in, in her front yard yelling at me skateboarding on the front yard and then you know eventually she passed and somebody else came along bought the property and built a you know a huge house next door and uh, I get it I get that perspective from the neighbors I get the impact that that can have in neighborhoods too um, so I'll be honest I, I don't know where I'm at on this specifically I'll probably figure it out in the next few minutes or I'd like to hear more from my colleagues about this but um, those would be my comments this is I, I think that there's valid perspectives on both sides and um this is a toughie <laughs> this is a really tough one so i'll just hold my comments there all right good comments i've, I've got a few to throw into the hopper <clears throat> yeah i had strong feelings about this one too i wanted to point out a few small nice good things that the project did the heat pumps are in a super cool spot they're very far away from your neighbors i don't think anyone noticed that but they're on the inside of the lot you know, heat pumps, they don't make much noise. They sound like your fridge. I just got one. You can come by and see it. But they do make noise, so that's super cool to put that in the middle of a lot and not in your setback, which you're totally allowed to do. Um, it's not like a loud noise, but it's a small, annoying noise, which is almost as bad. Um, thank you for keeping that noise yourself. Uh, Cindy and I don't agree on carbon in buildings. There's the first cost, the carbon invested in building it. This is what I do for a living. I can assure you that from the day you move in on, this will be the most efficient home in the city. Like the California code is insanely hard. It will basically make you do a net zero house, more or less, including probably a big old Tesla battery. So it's going to cost, get used to it. When I saw the solar panels on the roof, I'm like, oh man, you're going to need more than that. But rest assured, once that first carbon is spent, this will be a very efficient home. Um, it's going to be there. I mean, who knows, in 10 years, 20 UCSC students might be living here. It might be turned into a ADU. So I have feelings about big homes. I am living in a 900 square foot home with two kids that are younger than yours. So I feel the pain of like the sewer breaking down. Oh my gosh, you know. My dad built our house he bought in 1976 into a 2,600 square foot home, some people remember, and was was excoriated as betraying the hippie movement and not a true pacifist for having this huge 2,600 square foot house on King Street. So um, I'm all right with building as big as you possibly can. I'm sorry to the neighbors, there are impacts. I gotta say, like, the shade from this house also goes north, you know, so you'll have the morning and the afternoon, that one hour of solar production, that's something. But, um, you know, compared to a lot of other spots, this is a pretty good spot to just build what your right is. Um, and then I like bristle. I'm reading this book about the American frontier and like the, you're going to tell me what I can do on my land. I think I'm getting older and more conservative, but that really drives me nuts. So I just want to identify that I felt that pain in your voice of like your neighbor is telling you what to do on your land. And, you know, this is like back in the frontier when it was like you and your shotgun, your little log cabin. So again, not to get all political, but yeah, we have enough rules. They're terrible. Thank you for building a house. I can't make a motion, but let's move this along and, uh, and go build a house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to make uh, a couple of clarifications for, um, so uh, my, my comment is not about the efficiency of the house because obviously you're, you're, you're building, you know, as, above and beyond in some cases, right? But the bottom line is the more resources you use to build a house, it creates a bigger carbon footprint. That's just a, that's a fact of science. That's, that's indisputable. So the bigger something is, it takes more resources to build that thing. So let's just be clear on that. I also just want to point out that we're all on unceded land of indigenous people. So let's be a little careful about my land, my property, and you know, nobody telling us what to do. Um, and again, it, I, I think, my hope is that as a community, we think of ourselves in Santa Cruz as being the leading edge of the green movement, um, that we think of ourselves as being progressive. It is gonna impact our lifestyles if, if we are going to make decisions as a community to address the climate crisis. It, we're not gonna be able to do business as usual. And part of that is thinking about scale. And so that's, that, that is where my head is at on this one. So thanks.
Well, we're going to need a motion here soon enough. Let me just remind everybody that this is just about this, this project, you know, and there's plenty of other city policies we could address large homes in. Or the, what's in front of us today is to deny the appeal or uphold it. So I'd like to move back to that. <laughs> I'll be the bad guy. All right. Uh, unless you want to. No, I think we're all. I mean, it seems like maybe with the exception of you, I mean, we're, we are, well, even you said we you've had struggles with that or it it hit accord with you this you know with and it's um i wish that i was more <laughs> absolute like you are <laughs> but um it's a tough one i mean i i will say from a design perspective because that's what i do i you know we got ourselves into a situation where what they've done is i mean that that they've worked through the, through the system and they've and they've met the goals and um I want to support this family staying here and being here. I also appreciate the neighbors' concerns. Do I wish it was an SB9 and four affordable by design units or that they would have designed it to grow differently with their family over time so that they could all live in individual units rather than five suites? Like with a design firm, <laughs> they might have been able to come up with some creative solution, but that's not what's in front of us. So I'm, you know, I think I... I'm struggling with it, but I feel like I. So are three options. Are I'll there. be. I'll make a motion if okay. we want to get that going, and then we can just vote. So, um, I'd like to make a motion um, to uphold the appeal. Is there a second? Motion dies for lack of a second. The middle road is continuing it, but I just, I see that the, the. Um, applicants have, have compromised and redesigned and redesigned and redesigned three, four times. So I don't know that continuing it's going to like make some breakthrough. Because we are not all up here, all four of us have to agree or it continues naturally, right, Eric? Right. You, Token you, for more people next time. Uh, you can uh, make a motion to continue. Um, if, if that's your will, I would, um, recommend that you bring the applicant up because under the code, the applicant can ask for a decision. Um, if, if you're wanting to continue it, um, I would recommend that there be some direction if this is a continuance for redesign. Um, you know, is there, is there something about the design that you take issue with that um, you feel um, if were changed, it would make it easier for you to make the findings? Um, I just wanted to also make a couple comments um, based on some of what I heard. Um, I just wanted to, to reconfirm that the 3,000 square feet is not a limit. It's, a, it's, it's where we drew the line back in the 1980s at what requires design review and what just needs a building permit. So other than that, there's there's no other meaning. It's not a restriction. It's it's just a it's it's a line. And if, if this was on a 7,000 square foot lot, which it's not, we'd barely be talking about this. So that is a that is a reality. If it was zoned R17 right. and it was on a 7,000 square foot, yes, that's would, correct. It'd yeah. be a 3,500 right. square We're foot. We're only having a discussion because it's an R1, I mean an R515, yeah. yeah. The other thing I'd like to just mention from, from a personal perspective, I served um, as zoning administrator here for 12 years. So I heard a lot of design review for single family. And one of the things I learned um, was that um, it's, it's not always about square footage. Uh, a 1,500 square foot house can look bigger than a 3,000 square foot house. It's all about the articulation. So I, I was never one to get hung up on, on numbers. It was really about the design. And so I would encourage you to uh, perhaps think about that, especially when your findings are directed at design. 
I just wanted to mention, though, that um, yes, it is just a line in the sand, but it is very common. I did go down the Google rabbit, rabbit hole and looked at a lot of other cit cities and municipalities where they required a large house review, and 3,000 was pretty common. Um, so just, you know, that that's not out of bad. Like, the standard of practice is pretty common to review for homes above 3,000. Yeah, um, I just, um, I think that right now, from what I've heard from the appellants, from the applicants, I think that if we approve this tonight, right now, um, there would be, uh, or there would exist a, what I assume already exists, which is bad blood in the neighborhood that probably would not be reparable to what things would be, things were, before this whole project came apart or you know came about so i'm inclined to ask both the appellants and the applicants if there's any way that um you could agree to sit down and we could continue this if it's a no then i'm fine with that but i do want to ask the main appellants and the applicants if that is a possible thing if things have progressed to the point where it's just like no we're done we're moving forward we are just at an impasse, and that's what it is. Well, speaking on behalf of the appellants, we're perfectly happy to sit down with the applicant and have offered to do that numerous times. So we'd be pleased as punch to do that. I do and have a question. Take, actually. Oh. I'm sorry. Take your time discussing too. If it, you know, I know you're probably not prepared to answer that question. I, Nancy, can I ask you a question while they're discussing this? I meant to ask this earlier, but what is the, it doesn't seem like there's actually a public notification process for this because it's not a variance or anything, right? It's So the, the notification to neighbors is just at will. Is that correct? Or is it, is it? No, they, more? they're. They, but is it notification through the city? It's not like, I mean, like, it's the card that goes out in the mail or, yeah. Right. Like and then it's, an ad put in the newspaper. Yeah, okay. Yes. And the site is also site. posted. Right, but there's no, like, meetings required or anything like that. Oh, like, like or, community yeah, meetings? Like, nothing no, like that. No, it's not, yeah. it doesn't rise to right. that level. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have some concerns at this point of like sending these two parties off to meet amongst themselves. Yeah. <laughs> that should be mediated by staff. Well, sure. If that's the direction you all are headed. I, I guess I just want to get a feel for that because, and you know, not to bring up too many personal anecdotes, but in the big house that went up next door to me, I mean, the people that built it, there was bad blood. They, you know, they poisoned my mom's begonia plants because they didn't like it on the fence. Like there was like a little war going on in between me and our next door neighbors, literally like, and I, it's not, that's not positive, right? I mean, things have a way of working themselves out, even if some party prevails or the other prevails. Like, I don't want to see that happen. I don't, you know, so I, I guess I'm just, I'm torn on, on the issue. I mean, and I think that maybe there's a way for people to sit down, maybe in the, presence of staff to see if something can be worked out. If nothing can be worked out, then that that is what it is. But, you know, I guess that's where I stand on this. But uh, I... <laughs> So, Nancy, how do you feel about the idea of further work? Do you think there'll be a breakthrough, or what's your gut feeling? If, say, we were to continue it and have some more discussions with you kind of in between, how fruitful do you think that would be? Well. In terms of just what I have seen through the course of reviewing this project, it seems, you know, with the public hearings were held, there's the concerns raised, there's the direction given, there's like the applicant is trying to revise it to address the neighborhood concerns, but I think some of the, the bottom line is like, just like it, Eric mentioned, you know, you say 3,500 square feet, you can look at a house and it's like, whoa, that's, that is like 4,000 square feet. How do you, you know, so a lot of it is also in the context of what is trying to be achieved. Again, this is a predominantly single-story neighborhood, but it evolved in 2005 with the two-story addition. 
that direction and lay out my guess it was not dictated by city codes it was directed by reality they want to do additional square footage the house the single story house appeared fine they did the addition which most people do because in terms of having to upgrade the foundation upgrade the you know the electric you know just all the details in that existing house most people add to the back um, the situation you know the applicants had different circumstances that they needed to deal with um, would they have if they could kept the front one-story house and build behind it I don't know you know that's uh, the application that came for us was what it is so in terms of trying to garner a compromise, um, again, you know, we had the public forum. There was a period of time where, you know, it's like, so what are the concerns? You know, if, if it was a no, like, no two stories, no 3,000 or greater, um, you know, I think that that's kind of where the dilemma is. The, res, uh, the you know, immediate neighborhood might have something in mind that they're not completely conveying if it was like, you know, yeah, if you set your second story 40 feet back, we'd be happy. If you said it was only 3,000 square feet, we'd be happy. It's this design by committee part, that, that's the whole part with, which is difficult with this process. Yeah. You know, there's certain findings, Agreed. there's certain criteria that says, okay, if you can do this, can you do that? Um, that's the unfortunate part with a discretionary permit because you can't please everybody. Yeah, yeah. And then it's just like, so where do, where do you draw it? What is the whole purpose of this type of permit? And that's why it's, even though the zone district is R15, you know, 5,000 square feet, a minimum lot area, these lots are larger. Yeah, you yeah, know, and, yeah. and if, if it was an R17 lot, we probably wouldn't be having this discussion because the code would have said, you can have a 3,500 square foot house. You go higher than that, then okay, we'll review it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. so we that all, that we whole all thing about agree portion. At least all the objective ones. All yeah. All left with the subjective. So. Yeah. That, that's and the that's hard where, part. Yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, this uh, is. I mean, I'm willing to put my own personal well, feelings aside. Okay, go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I subjectively like this house. Think it's wonderful and green and should be immediately approved. Let's go. That's my subjective opinion. Maybe we should like send it on to council. They could apply the global greenhouse policy, but unless we get four votes, we can't even do that. Yeah, I think the only way it gets to council is on appeal. Yeah, yeah. So you'll need to make a decision. Gets appealed, then they yeah. could see it's consistent with the climate action. I mean, if, if the applicant's willing to sit down with the neighbors, we're willing to um, participate in that discussion. Um, we but, haven't heard but, that. That was our suggestion. Yeah, <laughs> you've, heard, you've heard, you know our recommendation. The design is involved significantly. So we're in support of it. Yeah, the, oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I, I just want to say, I, I'm not saying that it needs to be in compliance with the Climate Action Plan. I'm, I'm saying that we have the ability as the, as the Planning Commission today to, to weigh in yes or no on a large home. Like, that, that, is what, that is one thing that's before us, right? And what I am saying is... I want to weigh in and say that I do not think it is in the community's best interest for us to continue to build really large homes into the future, full stop. Do you feel that way so strongly that you would you know, vote? Which way would you vote as a result of those feelings? No? Uh, that's a pretty good <laughs> guess. I mean, I've said that several times. <laughs> Just want to be really clear about it, because what we're about to do is sandbag their project, right? More or less. Like we went over you know, I mean, they do have the. I mean, they they've mentioned that they could, uh, and I absolutely do not want to discount the time and energy and the emotional energy of doing anything on one's property, <laughs> whether it's a redesign or like you know, changing the way a shed looks. It, it's an intense process. But, w but what I am saying is that, I mean, you do, there is the option on the table for no review if they go back to, two, you know, 399.9999, or 299.9999 square yeah. feet. And then whatever they come up with goes, Good point. right? That's so it's, it's yep. not like, 
it's not like there's no building if if we That's don't correct. approve a large yeah. home permit. There can be building, yeah. absolutely. I think your and options are you can approve, add conditions, uh, you can continue again if you if that's the way you want to go I'd recommend you bring the applicant up to get their take on whether they want to vote or not if you continue I would provide some direction um, on design changes or you can deny and if you choose to deny we need to know what kind of findings you want us to write uh, in that decision uh, do, do we need four to continue or is it a simple majority? it's a it's simple majority so three votes all right, can we hear from the applicant? The applicant on sad feelings on possibly continuing this? Oh, yeah. I, we've had, I think, a number of discussions uh, with our neighbors in the past. We've had the opportunity to listen to 20 of our neighbors um, during the first uh, zoning administrative meeting. We've had the opportunity to look at at least 30 or 40, but probably more like 60 or 70 letters uh, in opposition. Um, with some very interesting findings about us personally, our plans for the housing, our plans as people, who we are. I think we've had a lot of communication. Um, and we've sat at each of these people's houses a number of times. Um, Chris and Dory had an idea that we could put a bedroom up on the second floor. That would be enough, because that's all they have. So why would we need more than that? Um, Matt and Connie, though they didn't put it in their zoning administrative uh, we're very clear that they did not want over 3,000, just like you did. It's very similar in my mind to the CEQA stuff where we fight against uh, building high-density stuff because that specific instance has an issue for CEQA, but overall, that's not actually what helps. The higher density helps. Um, so I don't know that my children are going to be able to afford to live here in Santa Cruz because it's very expensive, partly because of people like my mom's generation who's decided that building is bad. So I have a lot of history around, you know, how this all works. Um, and I feel like we're trying to provide a home for our kids so they can live here in Santa Cruz for a while in a high density, basic fashion. Um, I think we've tried very hard to be accommodating. Uh, we have another design for trying to make the east wall um, better and potentially. Uh, I have an architect friend that thinks it's a much better way to articulate the wall. We didn't even present it because I think our neighbors would not like it. It's a projection instead of an inset on the east wall, which does provide better relief but may and does not hit against any variances, uh, but I think maybe provides less privacy for the neighbors to the east and adds square footage to the, to the house. So there's a lot of stuff we have chosen not to do. Yeah. Um, it's well within you know code and well within our rights as from what I understand from reading uh, through that. So um, yeah, after a lot of conversations with a lot of our neighbors and a lot of very strong feedback from our neighbors and because they're very politically active, a lot of other neighbors within the whole city of Santa Cruz, I think we've probably had enough communication with them. Yeah, okay, that's fair. Okay, um, with that said, I, I find an appeal to what at whatever we decide tonight to be very likely. So I'm going to make a motion to accept the staff recommendation that the Planning Commission deny the appeal, upholding the Zoning Administrator's acknowledgement and approval of the environmental determination and approval of the demolition authorization permit and design permit based upon the findings listed below and conditions of approval listed in, in Exhibit A. I'll second it. Let's call for a roll call vote. Unless there's further discussion. Oh, I, I'd just like to make one more comment. So uh, I don't want this to be confused with high density housing, right? So, you know, this is for, this is a single family home. And if we looked at the floor area ratio on such a big home, I mean, so it, it, we're not talking about high density housing. This is a single family home. So just for clarification's sake, to the vote. Single family home with an ADU. Okay, to the vote. With multiple families in it. <laughs> no. Two units. Commissioner Dawson? No. Gordon? Yes. Polymus? Yes. Chair Kennedy? Yes. And just for clarification, that motion includes the enhanced uh, condition regarding relocation assistance that Nancy put up on oh, the board. That's a good clarification. 
Correct. Do I? Do we need to go back? That's or okay. Just I. I assume that that was consent. In the. Uh, okay. In the original I motion. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank good. you. Nice job. <laughs> So what happens next? It's uh, that's information that's items. Of, uh, yeah, I can uh, I, okay. give you a brief report. I would like to understand in terms of the subcommittee uh, assembly and unpacking some of the things that we talked about today. Um, okay. Tonight, ha ha what happens there? Like, what's the next step? What's the action item there? Yeah, I think um, you know, as I mentioned, we're looking at at some grant opportunities um, to to look at. Um, enhancing some of our objective development standards. Um, we've got SB9 right now that requires ministerial review uh, through the creation of some standard lots. So we're, we're regulating design on old substandard lots, but doing nothing with design on new substandard lots. So we're hoping to uh, get a bit of reconciliation there. We'd like to get something around the large home um, and so, uh, you know, if um, we pursue uh, a grant and uh, get funded for it, um, we can begin work on that, and, I, and then, then it would become part of our work program. And I think at that time we would we could look to you to establish a subcommittee um, around that. Great. So, at a later date. In the meantime, you can just email comments to Eric. It's effective. Sure. Can you clarify what just happened? The appeal was just denied. Uh, the appeal was denied by a vote of three to one. Good question. It's part of my job to state that. All right, so we will now move on to informational items. Sure. Um, so last month, the Coastal Commission uh, uh, heard an appeal of the project at 190 Westcliff Drive. So this is the parking lot across from the Dream Inn. It's a mixed-use project. It was actually approved by the city back in uh, 2019, and the appeal didn't get heard for quite some time. Um, it's a mixed-use project. It's 89 uh, condominium units above uh, ground floor commercial with some underground parking. Um, so they, uh, they found there was no substantial issue with the appeal, which is basically a decision not to hear the project. So the, the application's approved, and now the applicants can go on to working drawings and building permitting process. Uh, so that was uh, good news. And did it make it through the little tiny roundabout? Yeah, that's all part of the project. Even yeah, the traffic, all, like, all, way worse. Also. All of the um, the public improvements, the bike lane improvements, that's all part of the mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the application. So, um, so upcoming schedule uh, on your next meeting. Of course, we have the the Ferris wheel that was continued. Um, we also have a mixed use project uh, on SoCal in there May. It's a forty three unit mixed use project. So you hear that. Um, and then, in, Eric, is that a new design? We saw that one before, didn't we? No, I don't think so. There's okay. been a couple iterations of the okay. design. It's been on our website. SoCal and May Avenue, is that? Right? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. right near May. And then uh, in September, we're looking at one of those two meetings to um, for a mixed-use project on the other end of SoCal uh, near Hageman. It's at 1800 SoCal, um, and that's, that's also a mixed-use 84-unit uh, project. So that's what, what you have on the horizon. It was near May Sushi. <laughs> there, yes. <laughs> That's yeah, the, that used that's to be Takara. Yeah. Right. It's better. Right. <laughs> um, sorry. That's that's all I have. Do we know in when in September that's? Um, it's looking like it's probably going to be the second meeting in September, which I, is the twenty first. Great. Uh, we don't have any items referred to future agendas or subcommittees. Uh, so with that, I adjourn this meeting of the Santa Cruz uh, Planning Commission. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you.